I have a message that every born-again, spirit-filled Christian needs to hear. I grew up in the Christian church and was taught at a very young age about the need to be born again and filled with the Spirit. These are fundamental teachings of the Christian religion that I completely agree with. The problem that I discovered is that many Christians fail to understand why the Spirit was sent, why they need to be filled with the Spirit. This coincides with another contradiction that exists in Christianity concerning the commandments, which Christians collectively refer to as the law. I was taught, as most Christians are, that obeying the law of God is legalism, and following the law leads to bondage. Now this belief is typically gleaned from various letters from Paul found in the New Testament. But nowhere else in the Bible will you find anything to support the belief that the commandments of Elohim uh, place people into bondage. Elohim, by the way, is the Hebrew title for God. In fact, the scriptures describe just the opposite. King David proclaimed, You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. You are near, O Yahuwah, and all your commandments are truth. My tongue shall speak of your word, for all your commandments are righteousness. So here we see the commandments uh, likened with wisdom and righteousness and truth. And King David delighted in the commandments. These are just a few examples that extol the commandments in the scriptures. Sadly, most Christians view the law quite the opposite largely because they fail to understand that there's a difference between the law of Elohim and the laws of men. The laws of men put us in bondage, while the law of Elohim leads us to life. And what many fail to understand is that the law of Elohim, consisting of the commandments, is called Torah in Hebrew. And Torah means instructions or teachings. The Torah is not bondage by any means. Rather, it's meant to guide us on the straight way the righteous path, just as King David referred to the commandments as righteousness. In fact, the first time we read about the Torah was when Yahuwah appeared to Isaac and told him not to go to Egypt. He said, Then Yahuwah appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in a land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my Torah. And that's in Genesis 26, 2 through 5. So the blessings came from the fact that Abraham obeyed the Torah, among other things. Therefore, calling the Torah the law and associating the Torah with bondage is a fundamental mistake that many make because they've been poorly taught. They've listened to the instructions of man and not the Torah of Elohim. Because man's laws are burdensome and oppressive, they make the mistake of thinking that the Torah of Yahweh is also burdensome and oppressive and something that cannot be obeyed. Sadly, this is the same lie that originates in the garden where mankind were first deceived, which kept us from the tree of life. See, the Torah is a guide to blessings in life and intended to keep us away from sin, curses, and death. That's why Messiah Yeshua spent so much time confronting the religious leaders of his day. They were burdening people by placing them under a heavy yoke, sometimes referred as under the law. When people are subjugated to man-made laws, that's when they're under bondage. Remember, the Yahuwah delivered the Israelites from the yoke of bondage of the Egyptians. He freed them from the bondage and slavery that they were under. He brought them to Sinai, where he entered into a marriage covenant. Yahuwah is in the business of deliverance, not slavery. And it was important that he not marry a slave bride, but rather a bride that had been freed and could make a decision while not under duress. See, the Torah given to Israel was the marriage contract. Now we know that Israel was an unfaithful bride and broke the covenant, which led to separation. And Yeshua the Messiah came to heal that broken relationship. He came like Moses, preaching and teaching that same message. Yeshua was delivering the people from the oppression 
of the religious leaders. Yeshua came as the Torah in the flesh looking for a bride. That's why he stated, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore what Elohim has joined together, let not man separate. Literally, in the Greek we read, what Elohim has yoked together. You see, many marriages fail because the husband and wife are not yoked together, living and working in harmony for the same purpose. You see, many times when we think of a yoke, we think of two oxen uh, plowing in a field. Uh, If the oxen are not moving in the same direction, then the yoke is ineffective and the job does not get done. So the function of the yoke is to unify and lead in a purposeful direction. And that's the point of the Torah, so that man and woman could be yoked together, focused in the same direction, and at the same time, they were supposed to be yoked to Elohim, so that their focus would be on the covenant and the path back to the garden. Yeshua came teaching the pure Torah, and he specifically stated, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. You see, Yeshua was the bridegroom proposing to his bride. He was Elohim in the flesh, and he wants us to be yoked to him by his Torah. Indeed, the true Torah does provide rest, as we are actually commanded to rest from our labors once a week. What an incredible blessing. Our Creator knows as well, and many of us have a tendency to push ourselves beyond our limits, and that can result in getting exhausted, stressed out, and and literally burned out. Uh, He loves us so much that He actually commands us to rest every week. The commandment is there to bless us and is meant for our physical, mental, and spiritual well-being. It's an amazing gift that some people actually view as oppressive and legalistic. Now, this is understandable if you fail to distinguish the simple commandments in the scriptures concerning the Sabbath as opposed to the hundreds of man-made rules and regulations developed by the Pharisees and continued by rabbinic Judaism. You see, they've turned the simple commandments in the Torah into a myriad of oppressive laws that place heavy burdens on people who simply need to rest. Yeshua was pointing people back to the simplicity of the Torah, the simplicity of the commandments. And he taught the Torah, sometimes referred to as the Torah of Moses. He specifically said, if you believed Moses, you'd believe me, for he wrote of me. Now, instead of understanding that Yeshua was making a distinction between what Yahuwah commanded through Moses and what the Pharisees were dictating, Christianity has made the mistake of thinking that the Torah is bad and was actually done away with. Now this understanding is in spite of the fact that Yeshua specifically stated, do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled. So the Christian view of the law is upside down and backwards. In fact, it's directly opposed to the clear words of the Messiah and results in their rejecting the easy yoke offered by Yeshua because they're confusing it with the oppressive laws of man. Now, this is the first critical mistake made by Christians that then actually results in a warped understanding of the Creator. You see, once Christians assume that Torah observance results in bondage, they must now assume that the God of the Old Testament is unfair, cruel, and sadistic by creating a covenant with his people and then subjugating them to a burdensome system that they can't possibly keep. Uh, They then must believe that their God is schizophrenic because he apparently changed his mind, uh, then sent his son to die for Christians and, and then abolished those harsh laws that he previously forced upon the Israelites. So he tormented and punished the Israelites for not obeying the law only to replace them with Christians who now don't have to obey the law. How unfair is that? Actually, there's nothing fair or just about that understanding, nor is there anything true about that understanding. It's simply false. In Malachi 3.6 we read, For I am Yahuwah, I do not change. 
Uh, the truth is that disobedience began in the garden and it's a problem that's plagued mankind from the beginning. Mankind was given instructions from the very beginning and it was the failure to obey that led to the expulsion of the man and the woman and a need to reestablish a right relationship with the Creator. The sin of disobedience requires atonement. And in order for sinful man to once again dwell in the presence of a holy creator, there must be cleansing and forgiveness. Uh, this process is described through the scriptures, and we see a covenant flowing from Noah to Abraham through his seed to the covenant assembly of Israel. Now, when we talk about Israel, we're not referring to the modern state of Israel or even ethnic Jews for that matter. Rather, we're talking about a people who enter into and remain in a covenant relationship with Yahuwah. Israel was meant to be a nation of priests that would shine as a light to all the nations and draw the nations back to Yahuwah. You see, the nations were essentially established and divided after the rebellion of mankind at Babel. Israel was supposed to restore the divided nations and bring them back to Yahuwah through obedience. Israel failed in that function and instead, Israel was divided and ex exiled into the nations. The prophets foretold of a restoration of Israel through a king. And through the restoration of Israel, the original purpose would be accomplished. We read about that in Ezekiel 34 at 23. I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd, and I, Yahweh, will be their Elohim, and my servant David, a prince among them. I, Yahuwah, have spoken. So the divided kingdom would be reunited as two sticks in the hand of the king. And we read about that in Ezekiel 37, 15 through 24. So the 12 tribes and the two houses of Israel will be restored through King Yeshua. Now many incorrectly believe that the modern state of Israel was a fulfillment of the prophecy, but it can't be so. You see, the modern state of Israel does not qualify because the restored Israel will be shepherded by the Messiah Yeshua, who is currently rejected by the modern state of Israel. Also, the restored Israel will be cleansed and will be restored to the covenant, and that simply is not the case with the modern state of Israel. Nor is it the case with the Christian religion. So contrary to the common belief that Christianity has replaced Israel, nothing could be further from the truth. You see, Yeshua the Messiah did not come to abolish the Torah, nor did he come to start a new religion. He came to renew the covenant and reunite the divided tribes according to the prophecies. That's why he specifically selected 12 disciples representing the restored kingdom of Israel. The restoration would occur through a renewed covenant prophesied by Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 31, beginning at 31, we read, Behold, the days are coming, says Yahuwah, when I will make a renewed covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says Yahuwah. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Yahuwah. I will put my Torah in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their Elohim and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, Yahuwah, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Yahuwah. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Just as Moses mediated the covenant through Passover to Shavuot at Sinai, Yeshua mediated the renewed covenant from Passover to Shavuot in Jerusalem. Shavuot is the feast of or the appointed time often called Pentecost in Christianity. Now through that covenant renewed by Yeshua, Yahuwah would put the Torah on our hearts and in our minds, just as Jeremiah prophesied. Also through this renewed covenant, there will be forgiveness of sin. The New Testament describes the Messiah Yeshua who came as the son of David, the son of Elohim, to renew the covenant at a Passover meal, often called the Last Supper. He died, rose again, and then sent the Spirit on the appointed time of Shavuot. By no coincidence, the Spirit was poured out in Jerusalem on the same appointed time when the commandments were spoken by Yahuwah at Sinai. 
Those commandments were given to Israel so that they could learn the ways of the kingdom. And Moses was there to instruct the people, to teach them. Yeshua came as the prophet like Moses, as was prophesied in Deuteronomy 18.18. 18. He taught the Torah. He renewed the covenant at Passover and shed his blood as the firstborn and Lamb of Elohim. After his death and resurrection, the Spirit was poured out upon the people gathering in Jerusalem, as described in Acts 2. And Peter indicated that that was the fulfillment of the prophecies given in Joel. Now, when this event occurred in Jerusalem, the kingdom was still divided, and the northern tribes had not yet returned to the land. Ezekiel actually prophesied about another future event involving the restoration of Israel and the Spirit. As prophesied in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 28, we, we read, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your Elohim. Now, whenever you read that, uh, you shall be my people, and I will be your Elohim, that's talking about them being in a covenant relationship. So the promise was cleansing by water, which represented uh, baptism or immersion, and then a new heart and a new spirit, which describes being born again. Then we read, I will put my spirit within you. Now why? We read that in verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Now the reason for this new heart and new spirit is reiterated by Ezekiel in another passage. Then I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within them, and take the stony heart out of their flesh, and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. And they shall be my people, and I will be their Elohim. But as for those whose hearts follow their desire, for their detestable things and their abominations, I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says Adonai Yahuwah. So he gives us a new spirit and a new heart so that we can walk out the commandments, not as the Pharisees taught, but rather as demonstrated by Yeshua. In fact, those who have hardened hearts and follow their own ways will receive repayment for their deeds, which is judgment. Isaiah describes judgment by fire in Isaiah 66, 16, for Yahuwah will execute judgment by fire and by his sword on all flesh, and those slain by Yahuwah will be many. Isaiah further describes the ones who get judged. Therefore, as the fire devours the stubble and the flame consumes the chaff, so their root will be as rottenness, and their blossom will ascend like dust, because they have rejected the Torah of Yahuwah of hosts and despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. So many will be judged by fire because they reject the Torah of Yahuwah. When Yeshua said, follow me, he meant it. Not only were his disciples to walk where he walked, but they were also supposed to walk how he walked. He showed his disciples how to obey as opposed to what the religious leaders were teaching and requiring. Yeshua came to teach us the ways of the kingdom. He came to prepare the bride Yisrael for a future wedding, and that bride expresses her love through obedience to the commandments, as opposed to the ones who follow their own hearts. He clearly stated, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So love and obedience are intimately tied to the commandments. The Holy Spirit is Ruach HaKodesh in Hebrew. It literally means set apart spirit. The Holy Spirit is sent to teach us how to be holy, or rather set apart. And the Torah is that teaching, the instructions. 
So if you're a follower of the Messiah, then you should be washed through the waters of immersion, dead to your sins, and born again through the renewed covenant. You must have your heart circumcised and be given a heart of flesh instead of a heart of stone. Now Moses referred to this as the circumcision of the heart. And now, Yisrael, what does Yahweh your Elohim require of you but to fear Yahweh your Elohim, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, to serve Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments of Yahweh and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to Yahweh your Elohim, also the earth with all that is in it. Yahweh delighted only in your fathers to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples as it is this day. Therefore circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. The reference to being stiff-necked is uh, referring to putting a yoke on uh, an animal. And if the animal does not have a sensitive skin and doesn't obey the directions, uh, he's stiff-necked. In other words, he's not following the leading. And of course, that's what the Torah is there for. It's a it's an easy yoke, it's a light burden, and it's there to guide us and direct us in the ways of righteousness. So we don't want to be stiff-necked. We want our uh, hearts to be circumcised so that we are sensitive to his spirit, hear his commandments, and walk in his ways. Once again, the point of a circumcised heart is that we walk in all his ways and to love him, to serve Yahuwah our Elohim with all our hearts and with all our soul and to keep the commandments of Yahuwah and his statutes. Instead of the Torah being written on tablets of stone, it can now be written in your mind and on your heart. That's the fulfillment of the renewed covenant. Not an abolition of the Torah, but a new place for it to be written. The entire point is so that we can obey the covenant instructions. Of course, what we read in Deuteronomy 10 regarding the circumcised heart is exactly what Yeshua taught. When asked what was the greatest commandment, he stated, The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Yisrael, Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And of course, that involves obeying the commandments. Yeshua was teaching people to obey so they would not fall under judgment. In fact, Yeshua specifically warned, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This group of many are very likely Christians. You see, the reason they are rejected by the Messiah is because they are lawless. They think they know the Messiah, but he says, I don't know you. They think they're doing the things that he wants, but again, he doesn't know them. Why? Because they're lawless. In the Greek we read anomia, and anomia means without the Torah. So the lawless are specifically those who reject the Torah, despite the fact that they think they have a relationship with the Messiah. So if you're a Christian and believe in Yeshua and have been filled with the Spirit, then you need to truly follow Yeshua and obey his words. Otherwise, you'll find yourself grouped with the many that he does not know. We don't follow the Torah like the Pharisees or Rabbinic Judaism, but rather as taught by Yeshua. Now, if you've been taught to reject the Torah, as many Christians have, you must understand that you've been lied to. Just as a serpent lied to the woman and deceived mankind to disobey, he seeks to deceive all mankind and lead them into lawlessness and away from the tree of life. Now the scriptures specifically connect obeying the commandments with wisdom and understanding. We read about the tree of life in the garden and the Proverbs describe wisdom as follows. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. We also read that the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. So wisdom and righteousness are compared to a tree of life. This is all about getting back to the restored garden, the new Jerusalem, 
where we find the tree of life. And the scriptures are very clear who will have access to the tree of life. Revelation 22:14 says, Blessed are those who do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So the Torah provides the way to the tree of life. And Yeshua gave another very important parable, which is again a warning. It was the parable of the ten virgins found in Matthew 25, beginning at verse 1. Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins, who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should be not enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Of course, Yeshua said that he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we read that in Matthew 15, 24. The house of Israel consists of ten tribes. And this is clearly a reference to Yeshua bringing the tribes back into the covenant through a wedding. He was not talking about the Christian church. And they were all virgins, and they all had lamps, and they all fell asleep. The only difference was the existence of oil and the lack of oil. The wise had oil to keep their lamps burning. The foolish had none. Now there's a connection between the oil and the spirit. We read in 1 Samuel 16, 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the spirit of Yahweh came upon him from that day forward. In fact, the menorah in the temple with seven lamps represented the seven spirits of Elohim, described in Isaiah 11. They would rest upon the Messiah, the son of David. There's also a connection between the Torah and a lamp of light. So the oil in the lamp represented the filling of the spirit that provided light on the path to meet the bridegroom, the way of life. The five wise were filled with the spirit and therefore they were obeying the Torah. The five foolish were late because they weren't ready. They weren't obedient. They had no oil. They were not following the commandments. We read that they share a similar fate as the lawless in Matthew 7. In Matthew 25, 11 through 12, he says, Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, As surely I say to you, I do not know you. He does not know the foolish virgins, just as he does not know the lawless. The message is clear. If you don't follow his ways, then you're not in his covenant, and you don't have a relationship with him. Even if you think that you do and you call him Lord, he doesn't know you. That's why Yeshua said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These are all ways of describing the Torah. Now, if this is new and shocking to you, then I suggest you go back to the original words of Yeshua. The first recorded words of Yeshua when he began his ministry were repent for the kingdom draws near. Now to repent means to turn away from sin and turn toward the ways of righteousness. Both sin and righteousness are defined in the Torah and the rules of the kingdom are found within the Torah. You can't repent if you don't know the definition of sin, just like you can't function in the kingdom without knowing the rules of the kingdom. So if you believe and follow the Messiah Yeshua and have been filled with the Spirit, you should be drawn toward the commandments and you should be obeying the commandments because that is the very purpose of being spirit-filled. It makes no sense that Yeshua would come and die for our sins and wash away our sins only to then tell us uh, we can go and continue to sin. It's absolutely absurd. There are lying spirits that lead people away from truth and we read about that in the scriptures. Elohim sends the set-apart spirit 
so we can obey the Torah, not so we can simply manifest spiritual gifts like speaking in tongues or casting out spirits. And the filling of the Spirit is definitely not so you could reject the Torah and live a life of lawlessness. Yeshua warned what would happen if our focus is not on Him and His commandments. The important thing is that we know Him and He knows us. That relationship exists when we are in covenant with Him. So if you're a Spirit-filled Christian, you need to consider your ways. Are you truly following the teachings of the Messiah and obeying the commandments, or are you walking in lawlessness? The answer to that question will reveal the Spirit you're actually filled with.